I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Hello, and welcome back to Animation Movies Revisited, where we take a look back at some of the greatest animated films and rediscover why they've left a lasting impression throughout the years. For this episode, we're going under the sea to the Great Barrier Reef, and then riding the East Australian current to Sydney to swim alongside Pixar's fifth CGI animated motion picture, Finding Nemo. After introducing audiences to Woody and Buzz, holding a microscope up to a bug's life, and revealing the secret life of monsters that go bump in the night, Pixar strapped on a diving suit to submerge themselves in the studio's most ambitious project up until that point. Before Finding Nemo, Pixar fans remain safely on land, free of the threats that populate the briny deep. However, Pixar began its legacy by pushing boundaries, and that's what the studio planned to do precisely by telling the most elaborate fish-out-of-water story ever set to animation. With an expansive setting covering about 71% of planet Earth, Pixar's brightest star creators invited audiences to where few are brave enough to tread, and danger lurks within every sunken ship and blackwater umbra. Finding Nemo, directed by Andrew Stanton and co-directed by Lee Unkirk, was based on an original story by Stanton, with Bob Peterson and David Reynolds penning the screenplay. Designed as a father-son tale in the guise of a grand underwater adventure, some say that Finding Nemo was Pixar's first heartbreaker film. It explored themes like death, loss, lasting trauma, crippling neuroses, and onto more transparent waters, growth, exploration of self, and hope. The story swims circles around Marlin, an overprotective clownfish who, after losing his partner and more than 400 of his unborn children, vows to protect his only surviving son, Nemo, with every ounce of his being. After Nemo gets taken by a human dentist to give as a gift to his troubled niece Darla, Marlin forces himself to go beyond the safety of his home to rescue his son. Along the way, Marlin meets Dory, a blue hippo tang fish prone to short-term memory loss. While Nemo plans his escape from a fish tank with the help of some new friends, Marlin and Dory embark on a life-threatening journey that takes Marlin beyond his comfort zone and makes him a legend of the ocean community in the process. Thanks for watching our show. If you like what you see, like this video, click on the bell to receive notifications every time a new one goes up. Now back to the show. Stanton spent a year developing Finding Nemo before sharing his ideas with the powers that be at Pixar. The inspiration for the story bubbled up after several memorable events. The first calls back to Stanton's childhood, when he used to visit a dentist who owned a fish tank as a part of his office decor. Stanton imagined the fish escaping their incarceration and making their way home to the ocean. This daydream stuck with him throughout the years. Later, after his kids were born, Stanton saw an image of two clownfish in a nature magazine sent to his home. The fishy duo reminded Stanton of family members traveling together, and he held on to that image in his mind's eye. In 1992, Stanton and his family visited Six Flags Discovery Kingdom. It was there that Stanton began thinking that an underwater kingdom would serve as an exciting setting for an animated film. Finally, in 1997, Stanton noted his propensity for parental paranoia while out for a walk with his son. Like Marlin, Stanton was policing his son's every move, instead of living in the moment. After admonishing himself internally, Stanton applied his epiphany to the characters and story of Finding Nemo. We all worry about our kid crossing the street, and possibly getting hit. We worry about them being out of sight the minute they turn the corner and we don't see them, Stanton said in an on-screen interview. We all know nature is a predatory world, pretty much 24-7. Something is out there trying to hunt trying to get them. When life gets you down, you know what you gotta do? I don't wanna know what you gotta do. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, swimming, swimming. What do we do? We swim, swim. Setting these dark thoughts aside, Stanton channeled his unease into Marlin, a hyper-paranoid father in desperate need of trusting his child's ability to weather what may come and permit him the space he needs to make mistakes. 
Stanton had completed the screenplay for Finding Nemo before production began, which was unusual for an animated film of this magnitude. Who's magnitude? Yo, 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 pop, 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 pop. When you see Bam! Early on, Stanton, Unkirk, and the rest of the team realized that they had a mature story on their hands. Finding Nemo would break new ground for Pixar, emotionally and technologically. While some parents were disturbed by the tragedy shown in the film's opening scenes, the filmmakers were later commended for their effort to set Pixar films apart from the rest of Disney's animated library. While The House of Mouse was no stranger to making orphans of its main characters, Pixar aimed to dig deeper and truly explore the damage done. As part of an odd lead-up to the film's release, public word of mouth declared Finding Nemo a flop before it swam into theaters. Brad Bird was busy working on The Incredibles, and it had all the makings of a bona fide blockbuster early on. Like Dory, the public's attention spans only went so far, but Stanton and his team were not going to be discouraged. Instead, they strapped on diving gear and took their research to new depths. During the production, the team went diving in several locations, snapping reference photos, interacting with some of the movie's stars, and learning about life in the Big Blue. Unkirk even went diving in the Great Barrier Reef to ensure that no reef was unexplored. Speaking of unexplored territory, early versions of Finding Nemo took an entirely different approach to the story of Marlin's partner, Coral, and how she and Marlin went from flirty fish to would-be parents. Before Stanton retooled Coral's devastating demise, the events leading to her off-screen death were portioned out using a series of flashbacks. Four flashbacks to be exact. Strategically peppered throughout the story, the first flashback featured an adorable meet-cute between the two characters. The second focused on Coral and Marlin as an established couple, moving into their new home. The third depicts a pregnant Coral moments before she gives birth to over 400 eggs. Finally, the last flashback omitted from the movie revolved around the death of Coral and every unborn child other than Nemo. Stanton wanted to pair each flashback with a pivotal moment in the film, though he ultimately decided to break everyone's heart within a few minutes instead. Rearranging elements of the story is a crucial step in the movie-making process. If the tale isn't presented to audiences in an entertaining and palatable fashion, your project is more or less dead in the water. The team behind Finding Nemo faced another major dilemma while trying to figure out how Nemo, who was 1,275 miles removed from his home, would get wind of his father's mission to bring him back to the Great Barrier Reef. According to the filmmakers, they solved the problem during an all-nighter at the studio. After fueling their brain meats with coffee and cafeteria treats, Stanton and the crew settled on creating a game of telephone between the underwater creatures. Now. Instead of accepting his fate as Darla's next victim, Nemo had the motivation he needed to make his great escape. You miss your dad, don't you, Shuckbait? Yeah. Well, you're lucky to have someone out there who's looking for you. While we're talking about the grit of the film's characters, this feels like a good time to wade through the voice talent featured in Finding Nemo. The first person to lend his voice to Marlin was Shameless and Mystery Men actor William H. Macy. The Fargo alum recorded most of the character's dialogue, before Stanton decided Marlin needed a gentler approach. The next actor to document the role was broadcast news actor and The Simpsons alum, Albert Brooks. In Stanton's opinion, Brooks saved the film with his energy and enthusiasm for the part. As for Dory, Stanton's first pick was Ellen DeGeneres. Stanton had been watching an episode of Ellen when he saw the comedic host change the subject five times before finishing one sentence. This quirk aligned perfectly with Dory's forgetful nature, and in Stanton's mind, it was only a matter of convincing DeGeneres to agree to the role. Thankfully, DeGeneres was more than happy to join the project and signed on without a second thought. Other stars that make Finding Nemo an unforgettable and emotional ride through open water are Alexander Gould as Nemo, Willem Dafoe as Gil, Brad Garrett as Bloat, Allison Janney as Peach, Austin Pendleton as Gurgle, Stephen Root as Bubbles, Vicky Lewis as Deb, John Ramft as Jacques, Jeffrey Rush as Nigel, Eric Bana as Anchor, Barry Humphreys as Bruce, Bob Peterson as Mr. Ray, Andrew Stanton as Crush, and Nicholas Bird 
as Squirt. As you can see, Finding Nemo has more stars than a sailor's sextant would know how to navigate. We've already touched on how a series of diving expeditions help bolster the research process for Finding Nemo. However, that only skims the surface of preparations made for this great film. Stanton and his team also attended lectures conducted by an ichthyologist, which refers to a branch of zoology that deals with fish. These talks helped inform how the characters in Finding Nemo move and react to the film's variety of environments. A fish's body movements are entirely different from a human's, so the team needed to discover a way to anthropomorphize the cast within the confines of their real-life behavior. This aspect of the creative process is more complex than you might think, especially when you consider the wide variety of body types found in the ocean. Each creature featured in the film was a puzzle meant to be solved by the animators. How do they move, talk, and react to the environment? These questions needed answers, and the solutions were never simple to overcome. Lighting the underwater environments also presented a substantial set of challenges to the team. The animators at Pixar often used rod lights to illuminate a scene. While some environs only required 10 light sources on their own, it could take up to 100 arrangements after adding characters to the stage. Pixar had different lights for each circumstance, including caustic, dancing, bounce, blue fill, murk, and fog lights. Each source of illuminescence played another part in bringing the ocean to life in liquid space. The soundtrack for Finding Nemo was arranged by Thomas Newman, cousin of Randy Newman, who composed every one of the studio's features up to that point. Newman's music captures the majesty, mystery, and danger of life in the ocean, with imaginative tracks that never fail to set the stage for adventure. The songs range from terrifying to playful, and never wade into kid-friendly bops to achieve Disney sing-along status. If you're hoping to rock out along the ocean floor, you might as well watch The Little Mermaid for more than a few oceanic bangers. Do you remember when I said the public thought Finding Nemo would be a flop at the box office? Those people were incorrect, but Finding Nemo also became the highest grossing animated film up until that time earning $871 million worldwide by the end of its initial theatrical run. By learning from past mistakes, Disney promoted the heck out of Finding Nemo with an impressive marketing campaign. Promotional materials for the film were positioned in front of movies like The Santa Claus 2 and the home video releases for Treasure Planet, Beauty and the Beast, Belle's Magical World, and more. Disney also went hard with arranging tie-in deals with companies like McDonald's, Frito-Lay, Keebler, Pepsi, Airheads, and other brands of prominence inside local grocery stores. Disney made sure everyone was aware of the film's release, and their aggressive approach paid off at the box office, and then some. Disney re-released Finding Nemo in 3D in 2012, adding $69.4 million to the film's overall total. Sadly, not all aspects of Finding Nemo's release yielded positive results. Upon falling in love with the film's characters, there was a massive uptick in purchasing clownfish as pets in the United States. The clownfish purchasing craze got so out of hand that tropical fish harvesting efforts in regions like the Republic of Vanuatu were disturbed by the trend. What's worse is that many people failed to inform themselves on the skill and expense required to care for the fish, and so many died or were returned to the pet store from whence they came. The mistreatment of the clownfish resulted in several environmental agencies calling for swift action against those responsible for the damage. Some aquarium owners got in on the protest by releasing a portion of their clownfish population back into the ocean. Unfortunately, many released the fish into uninhabitable waters, after failing to research the animal's required environs properly. Finding Nemo received a spin-off sequel in 2016, titled Finding Dory. The film saw Ellen DeGeneres reprising her role as Dory, the absent-minded hippo blue tang from the 2003 original. The plot revolved around Dory searching for her long-lost parents, with stars like Ed O'Neill, Caitlin Olsen, Ty Burrell, Diane Keaton, Eugene Levy, Idris Elba, Bill Hader, Dominic West, and Sigourney Weaver joining the cast. Albert Brooks and Alexander Gould also returned as Marlon and Nemo. 
In addition to getting its own game released in 2003 for PC, Xbox, PlayStation 2, Nintendo GameCube, and Game Boy Advance, Finding Nemo inspired a radical revitalization of the Disneyland attraction, Submarine Voyage. Dormant for years and on the verge of being torn down, Disney Imagineers rebuilt the classic ride to simulate the ultimate undersea adventure, featuring characters from Pixar's Finding Nemo. Complete with a new story, the Finding Nemo Submarine Voyage used electric submarines to take guests to an underwater kingdom made entirely of crushed glass, CGI characters, and genuine Disney ingenuity. Although the ride closed during the COVID-19 pandemic, the ride is expected to reopen in 2022. Finding Nemo was a mid-level Pixar movie for me before my recent rewatch. Perhaps it's come with age, or I see many of my friends navigating their lives as parents, but I have a newfound appreciation for this beautiful movie. What Stanton and his team achieved in the early days of Pixar is nothing short of astounding. The underwater environments featured in Finding Nemo are superb, and certainly pushed the envelope of what the studio was capable of producing at the time. Old me found Marlon unlikable, and Dory downright irritating. I was a fool. My lack of emotional maturity clouded my perception of this film, which shows that revisiting some movies after you've been taught valuable life lessons can do wonders. Now, I'm wholly invested in Marlon's struggle to be a good father after losing so much at the film's start. I can appreciate Nemo's defiance and desire to prove himself to the person he values most. I empathize with Dory after sorting my own challenges with memory and acceptance. Finding Nemo is a movie about growth, and it's a visually splendiferous one at that. I'll be giving Pixar's Finding Nemo 9 Buzz Lightyears out of 10. One point short of perfection, Finding Nemo established a long-standing tradition of Pixar hitting audiences where it hurts. The heart. With valuable life lessons to be gleaned from the adventure, Finding Nemo remains one of animation's heaviest hitters concerning taking the art form in new directions. After venturing beneath the surface to a whole new world of possibility, it was only a matter of time before Pixar would take to the stars to tackle another arena of limitless potential. Before we go, I'd like to remind everyone that the best thing you can do is keep on swimming when life gets you down. If you have others along the way, it will only make the journey to recovery that much sweeter. That's all, folks. See you next time.